Welcome back to Homesteading with the Zimmermans, where we work hard and play hard on our little corner of land in Iowa. My husband and I were born and raised Old Order Mennonite, or Horse and Buggy Mennonite, as some refer to them as. And although we are no longer part of that culture or community, we are intentional about passing on the old-fashioned skills of our childhood to the next generation. We are back in the garden today. Um, we had a little bit of rain yesterday, which freshened everything up. And my tomatoes look, they're starting to look happier each day. So what I'm banking on is, what I'm banking on is that no matter what is going on with my tomatoes, be it um, a disease or a bug, or um, herbicide drift, giving them that manure and putting the compost, the mulch on, and now the upper 80s, lower 90 temperatures that are in the forecast will encourage a lot of vigorous growth and help them outgrow whatever is bothering them um, because the, your number one defense against anything, against bugs, disease, your number one defense is still a strong, healthy plant. Um, so herbicide drift, if it's that, um, I might not be able to help my tomatoes outgrow it. Um, but if it's a fungus or a disease, I do think um, that hot temperatures and a lot of fertilizer is going to help them snap out of it. So the plan for today is to get fence on these tomatoes and tie them up, um, get all their leaves up on the fence off of the ground. So the very first thing we have to do is dig out our cattle panels. Maxwell, go where he is. Okay, Kendrick, go to your end. The grass has really gotten a hold of it, doesn't it? Keep pulling. Go closer to Kendrick. Maxwell, I think that's where it's still stuck. Ready? You just have to pull it the right place. Okay, that's good. What else do we need, Kendrick? The post pounder and posts. And posts. So we had to buy new posts because all the posts that we did have for the garden got stolen for our fence making needs this spring, didn't they? Yeah. So we had to buy some new fence posts. Um, nope, look, it's gonna have to line up with the fence. Okay, and let's put the fence on that side of the tomatoes. It's for the tomatoes to, the, the fence is to support the tomatoes. So the fence has to be right next to the tomatoes. 
like on the same row as the tomatoes. Like, yes. Maxwell, lift it, let it, yeah, there you go. Now make sure it's straight. Can you try shaking it? See how sturdy it is. Oh yeah, that should be good. Yep. Turn it the same way as you did the other one. Yeah. I think there will be. Plus we have to add some more once. Okay, now hold it. Lean it towards him so he can put it on. Now make it straight with two hands, Maxwell. There you go. Sometimes they wake up and the cheese are on their food. <laughs> what are you actually eating? Uh, what is it called again? Purslane. 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 You're eating some purslane here in the row where my beets got nibbled by the rabbit. Good thing they didn't eat these. Yeah. So one of the number one reasons that we have switched from using tomato cages to a cattle panel fence for our tomatoes is the sheer amount of tomatoes that we plant for the family these days. So I was looking at investing quite a bit of money into real nice tomato cages um, because we plant between 25 and 35 tomato plants each summer and we decided that instead of getting all those tomato cages um, we would just use three cattle panels and far fewer posts because our tomatoes were growing so big that the cages would topple over so each cage needed a post anyway um, so this way we need a much smaller amount of posts and three cattle panels, um, sometimes four, depends if um, I plant more tomatoes. And even though it seems like this is a four person job to put up these cattle panels, it's very easily managed with two people. <clears throat> But because whenever I'm working around the farm or the garden, rarely is my goal just getting the job done. Um, like today, my goal is not simply to get supports put up for the tomatoes, but also to work on life and character skills um, with the three little boys. So that is why what is a two-person job um, appears here to be a four-person job. The other reason that we prefer cattle panels right now is because in the fall it's much easier to tear down the cattle panel and the T posts than it was to tear down, um, you know, 30 tomato cages and 30 individual posts. So Kendrick has been given the task to cut me 12 inches of wire and he's learning about um, using different parts of his body to um, guesstimate measurements when he doesn't have a tape measure or measuring instrument handy. So we use the wire to attach the cattle panel to the steel T posts and really I should have sent one of the boys to the garage to get me a vice grip or a pliers but my hands um, work just as well 
and whenever possible we like to go across the corner attaching two panels to one fence post i'm so glad we started when we did yeah if we would have started at this time we would have not made it right Harrison, go get me the post hole pounder. Remember where you laid it? I will, I guess. Mom, do you wanna? No, you can. Okay. The pool, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah. After months, these turtles are going to stay in the pool for like hours. hours. No. First, we gotta get really hot. We are. We are hot. I mean, like, no, let them get in when they want, okay? So because our cattle panels are 16 foot long, they tend to bow a little bit. And especially when our tomatoes get big and the, our tomatoes will grow all the way to the top of the cattle panel. And then when they are loaded with tomatoes, they get really heavy and they can actually cause the cattle panels to tip over, especially if we get a lot of rain and the ground gets really soft. So what we need to do is put a post the center of each cattle panel on the opposite side of the other posts as a support. So over the last 23 years of being a parent and studying my children and learning what causes them to thrive and how they um, you know, learn and grow, I've noticed that through the baby and toddler years, they need mostly free time with a little bit of chores and responsibilities, you know, sprinkled in here and there. And then through the preschool and early elementary age, they need about half. They need about half free time in a day and half, you know, chores and responsibilities. And this keeps them balanced and keeps them from being bored and becoming whiny and complainy. Um, and then as they reach the middle school age, the, the balance kind of swings more towards they thrive when they have mostly chores and responsibilities and free time. Um, a little bit less free time. It seems that when they get to that early middle school and middle school age, um, the they're, they really need to have more structure, more responsibilities, and more chores that make them feel like they're worth something, make them feel valued and worthwhile. So the boys are nine, they're eight, nine, and almost 12 right now. So they are a great little workforce and they get plenty of free time. Um, and then when, they're, when they start fighting and bickering with their free time, I know that it's time for us to all work together on a chore. Mostly I'm going to be working beside them. Sometimes I'll send them to do something, send them to get started, but rarely do they work completely on their own in, with a job. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut strips of an old t-shirt to tie up any of those tomatoes. Woo! That was cold. <laughs> it was sprinkling um, our newly seeded grass and the wind carried the drops right in here to my back. So what I'm going to do is just start some strips.
So this tomato here on the end is definitely big enough to tie up. So this one has two main stems. So I'm just going to start by gently tying it up and I'm not going to make it tight. I'm just going to give it some room. I'm going to tie up one stem and I'm going to tie up the other main stem. There's a little sucker I'm going to take out. And I'm just going to tie it up real gently. I'm not going to make it tight. And then once I have it tied up, I'm able to see how many more leaves and branches I need to take off the bottom. So that's kind of what we want it to look like. So I don't want any branches hanging down at this point anyway. Later on in the season, if I have branches hanging down, I don't worry too much about it. But especially in the beginning stages, you don't want to have branch, too many branches hanging on the ground. However, you also don't want to take all these branches down here off while your plant is still too young to have enough of other branches to properly absorb its nutrients and um, light from the air. Okay, I'm going to show you a little bit about another, um, I'm going to show you a little tip on tying up your tomatoes if you're using cattle panel. So whenever possible, you want to attach your, your string around a joint in the cattle panel because that'll hold it a lot sturdier and give it a lot less room to move back and forth. And this one was broken off some time along the way. So I got to wait for this one to get a little taller before I can tie it up. And see this one. This one has a lot of room to go up and down. And I don't mind it having room to go up and down as much as I don't want it to be on this bar right now and be able to go back and forth. Now later in the summer... When my tomatoes are big and bushy, and we really hope that they're going to get there this summer. Um, but if they don't, we uh, will just have to go to Plan B, which is buy our tomatoes for all the tomato products that we want to can. But hopefully, in another month, they will be big and bushy. And then I'm gathering a whole bunch of tomato up with a longer string and tying them up against the fence. Then I don't care so much which part of the fence I attach them to, but definitely when they're little, I want to support the tomato so I don't want it to be able to go back and forth a lot. And the fence right now, you notice that it, it's not really straight, um, but that's to be expected with 16 foot cattle panels. And I promise you that if my tomatoes get big and bushy like they normally do, nobody's going to notice that our cattle panels aren't straight. Okay, the sun is going down and I am going to I'm going to use this. This is the only fertilizer I use. Um other fertilizer that's not organic matter. And this is what my mom used. It's called Bill's Fer Perfect Fertilizer and 
spray and grow and spray and grow. And then we're gonna put a little bit of wetting agent on and put a little bit of wetting agent in and this is like a foiler feed. I, um, I use this whenever um, a crop or a plant is struggling to get started or get going or anytime I just want to give something a boost. And I will link all this fertilizer in the description. So what Bill's Perfect Fertilizer and Spray and Grow are is it's a compost, like a compost tea um, using fish emulsion and when it's brewed into a tea, it creates micronutrients um, that are able to be absorbed through the leaves and foliage of the plants. So whenever I am applying this foiler feed um, fertilizer, I like to do it at night um, so that the plants stay wet as long as possible and absorb as many of the nutrients as they can. Um, whereas if I do it during the daytime, the sun will dry up the liquid um, before the plants get to absorb most of it. Now, I know that it is common knowledge among gardeners that you don't want to put your plants to bed wet. So if you're going to water, you want to water and, you know, do things like this in the morning so that they dry out before nighttime. Um, but this time of year, I do not even worry about that. I'm only doing this foiler feed once a week, so they're only going to bed once a week. And also, our night times are not that long right now. Um, like, it doesn't get dark here until after 10 p.m. in June, and the sun's already up, and the birds are singing shortly after 4 a.m. So the nights are not that long. And the other reason I'm not worried about it right now is that my tomatoes are not struggling with any kind of blight um, so it's not like I'm aggravating an existing problem um, so I really don't worry about putting my tomatoes to bed with this moisture on their leaves once a week so it has been about 10 days since the overspray incident happened and it has been about a week um, since we put manure on the tomatoes and fertilized them and I'm excited to show you um, what they look like. The, this tomato plant right here was barely affected. Like one or two leaves were curly on this one. And I think I had a cart setting right there so that protected it from the drift. Um, so you can see how much growth we lost out on. And the rest of the tomatoes should all be that size. So we lost out on about a week's worth of growth on the tomatoes, but the good news is this was the this is what all the damaged foliage looked like. And all of the new growth looks good. So the plants are growing again. And all of the new growth looks good. This one has put out some new growth as well and all of the new growth looks good so so that's what i was looking for i knew that they would be a little stunted but i was anxiously waiting to see them put out new growth because that would mean um, that they're going to continue to grow and give me a harvest um, some of the other things that were affected are slower to show the damage like my raspberries my cherry tree and some of my perennials in front of the house but my tomatoes I was what I was most worried about and they are growing um, I'm gonna go show you my peppers so my peppers were affected as well so you can see this is what the foliage looked like but they have also started sending out new growth that looks okay because peppers are a little more sensitive um, we lost a little more than a week of growth I would say because they've just started coming back now 
So I called the state extension office and I'm waiting for them to give me a call back and to see how to proceed. Um, but I don't, like, I know the routes that they will take because I've talked with a couple people in our area and the route that they will take, will help me take is documentation, go to the farmer and the farmer will then be required to recompensate any losses. Um, with money but the thing is I don't want money I want my garden you can't put a price on the reason that we grow food you can't put a price on that I know like and I know that a lot of people they assume that we're gardening because we're too poor to go buy it from the grocery store and you know, so then we use our time instead of spending our money. And while that may be the truth for some people, and it may be what brought us to this point ourselves, um, I can, I could afford to go buy all the family's pasta sauce at the grocery store. I just don't want to. I want to know every vegetable that went into the pasta sauce and I want to know every ingredient and where it was sourced from on that ingredient list. So if that's the route they're going to take, then I'm not super interested. All I want is for the farmer to know that my 6,000 square foot garden means as much to me and has as much value to my family as his 80 acre field over there. I don't want to be seen as the little guy that, oh well, we'll just give them money and they can go buy their food and then they'll be quiet. Or then everybody will be happy. That's not what I want. I want him to understand that please don't spray on windy days. I understand, I'm not asking you to not spray. All I'm asking is test the direction of the wind and know that this has value to my family. I don't want your money. That doesn't have any value to me. This is what has value to me. So while we're talking about knowing what's in our food, knowing what has glyphosate in it and what doesn't. Um, one of the reasons that we are not putting any straw on our potatoes this year, like we have for the last, oh, I don't know how many years, is because I've started noticing a trend. And you can see these three rows of sweet corn here are not as tall and as lush looking as these the other rows over here. This is where the potatoes were last year. This is where I had straw on the garden last year. So if it is oat straw, usually what happens is farmers will spray their fields with an herbicide and it'll kill off all the oats and that helps them dry off evenly. If they let the plants dry off, dry back naturally, it's very uneven. So killing the plants with an herbicide assures that the oats are all be ready for harvest at the same time. So when we then take that straw and put it on our garden, some of that will get into our soil and stay into our soil. And depending what the oats or the wheat was sprayed with, um, it can leave a residual and it can cause your garden to, it can hinder what you want to grow in your garden because it won't grow as well because of that residual. And so it's been super hard to find. I've not been able to locate any organic straw anywhere. And if you've been here a while, you know that I don't quite trust the organic label anyway. So short of growing our own straw, um, I don't know that I will be putting straw on our potatoes again. Now I could put grass clippings down between the rows as a weed barrier, but <laughs> as of now we don't, we are only using a little Honda walk behind mower to bag our grass 
and I can only ask the children to gather so much grass in a week's time and there is only so much grass our yard isn't that large um, so there's only that much grass clippings that many grass clippings I can off I can um, gather the other thing is the one thing that I really really like to put on my garden is cow manure like you've seen last week I put on my tomatoes I could put that down between all these rows and it would serve as a fertilizer it would boost the soil and get it ready for next year's um, corn crop my problem with that is the cow manure is very heavy to work with like it is a lot of work now ideally that's what I'd like to do I'd like to put some cow manure down between all of these potato rows and nourish the soil that way um, but short of having a family work day where both my son-in-laws and Mitchell who's 16 and Elvin help me do it I don't know how much of it I can get put down this summer just because it's a lot of work it's heavy to work with it it was a lot for Hadassah and I to put that manure on the tomatoes so my dad used to have a tiny little manure spreader and a tractor and he would each fall he would put the manure on the garden for my mom that way um, but I don't really want to take a tractor into my garden so anyway I am just rambling on and on but thank you for visiting my garden with me again this week I promise that next week I have something different on the docket for next week and we will be back into the kitchen and you won't get to come to the garden next week but I sure appreciate all of you that humor me and work in my garden with me and look at my garden with me we'll see you next week